So um, we're going to get started. Uh, next up, we have Cody Soyland, and he's going he's gonna to talk about Django on G-Event. Um, just a reminder, though, there is overflow seating right next to this room. Uh, you'll get the slides and the audio. I don't think you'll get to see Cody, but um, you will have the slides and the audio. Um, so let's welcome Cody. Hello. Can you all hear me? Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about Django on G-Event. I'm going to start out with a shout out from my employer, Umble. Um, we are hiring, uh, so if anybody's interested, please talk to me in the, during the break. Um, definitely dev and ops both, so please talk to me. A little bit about myself. I've uh, been working uh, with Django for a little over four years. Um, I happen to be lucky enough to work for the Lawrence Journal World, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is where Django came from. Uh, worked there for about two years before moving to Austin. Um, and some of the things that I'm you know, really passionate about are um, you know, fast, scalable systems, and uh, obviously I love Django. So there's all this talk about the real-time web and how to um, instantly deliver information to your users as soon as your servers know about it. This Im introduces a lot of inter interesting scaling challenges, um, specifically keeping a lot of open connections alive at once. Uh, that becomes kind of problematic in some of the traditional uh, server environments. So there's this, uh, the C10K problem. This is actually a blog post, or a, you know, a, a post that was uh, a little old. I think it was 1999, but it was still, still definitely ve very relevant. Servers ought to be able to handle thousands and thousands of connections simultaneously. Uh, I definitely recommend checking out that post uh, for those who, you have, who haven't seen it. Um, so we have these new challenges, and the solutions for uh, concurrency, often we hear about non-blocking I.O. Um, and lowering your resource overhead, uh, every connection is, is valuable, and every connection can take up a certain amount of RAM. Um, and you want these connections to be uh, as light as possible, and you want them to operate well in a distributed environment. And so there's a few different ways people go about creating concurrent systems. Um, you can, if you want to, create a you know, fork of new process for every new connection. Uh, obviously, that doesn't scale very far, very fast. Um, Python processes are pretty heavyweight. You can use threads. Um, most people, you know, I would say most concurrent systems are using threads. Most Python applications are developed and deployed using threading. Uh, or you can use non-blocking I.O. Um, and typically, that falls into two camps. You can use callbacks, uh, which would be, uh, obviously, node.js is a very popular um, networking library written in JavaScript uh, that uses uh, continuation passing uh, style of callback I.O. Uh, and you can also use coroutines. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about threads real quick. The problem with threads um, is that they're non-deterministic. Uh, your operating system chooses, if there's more threads than, uh, than you have CPU cores, it has to time slice, and it switches back and forth between things. And this can be, this can sometimes create bugs um, or in, show you bugs that you probably didn't know about. Uh, you enter a whole new world of locks and mutexes, and just trying to wrangle threads is sometimes uh, confusing. Um, there is a memory overhead for threads. It's obviously not nearly as much as something like uh, process-based concurrency, but uh, it's still there and it definitely becomes relevant when you're talking about thousands of connections per machine. Uh, threads do have a nice synchronous interface uh, when you're using something like Django uh, that's full of synchronous operations. Threads just make sense for a lot of, of those situations. Um, and 
they are guaranteed to cooperate with your code. Um, so a blocking operation in a thread won't hold up your whole program. So that's, that is a nice thing about threads. Um, callbacks um, are one way to go about single threaded concurrency. So you have one thread that's managing multiple connections. Uh, callbacks, in my experience, are sometimes confusing to work with, though. Uh, when you pass a callback into a function, that function doesn't really know, the function that calls that doesn't usually know where it came from. So, um, you know, the call stack isn't around. Basically, your main loop calls your callback, and it's sometimes hard to debug. Simple things are easy when you pass a callback to handle I.O. Uh, when you're finished with an I.O. operation. Um, it, it's pretty clear uh, for the simple things, but when you need to control um, multi-step operations, when you need to do a series of things and wait in between them, sometimes chaining these callbacks can become very confusing in my experience. So coroutines are kind of the solution to that. And if you're working with coroutines for the first time, you'd feel like you're working with threads. Um, a coroutine actually, in its simplest form, is a type of function that is able to be uh, called into, but it can also call back to its caller. Um, coroutines have a unique ability of being able to run multiple of them at the same time. The simplest way in Python, or the most obvious way to implement coroutines is using generators. So if you have a bunch of generators, you can see how uh, you have multiple points in the stack, um, multiple points of execution that can each run separate. Um, you get a lot of the benefits of threads, but without the non-determinism associated with uh, preemptive uh, threading. So Greenlit is a Python module that provides coroutines in Python. Uh, Greenlit is actually a C extension module. It originally came from the Stackless Python project. And What's interesting about how it works is the call stack, you know, normally when you call a function, uh, the call stack increases by one, you print your stack trace and you see who called you. Uh, but when you switch to a green light, you're switching to it just as if you're performing a normal function call. But what's wild is that that green light just resumes execution from where it was from. Uh, that can be kind of hard to wrap your head around at first, but, um, once you grok it, it's, it actually is very nice to work with. So Gevent is a networking library built on top of Greenlit. And it basically provides green threads. It turns your greenlets into something that are scheduled. Uh, so when your greenlet chooses to resume ex execution on a separate greenlet, it doesn't have to say exactly where to go, it just says it needs to wait. Um, your, your green thread, as it were, um, can simply tell Gevent it needs to wait for a little bit for IO to complete. Um, and these are very lightweight. Uh, greenlets are, um, you know, you can have thousands of these uh, existing inside of a single POSIX thread. Um, they're co cooperative, meaning you, when you choose to suspend execution of a greenlet, um, you, you do so explicitly. Your operating system can't choose to run a different greenlet for you. Uh, and that's one of the things that I love about it. Um, it is very clear the order of things that are happening. When you run a program that uses greenlets, it runs the same way every time. Uh, you don't have the sort of race conditions and craziness that you have to deal with sometimes with threads. So jumping into a little bit of code, 
it's pretty easy to just spawn a new greenlet. You pass it a function and the arguments you need to pass to it. And G event often makes use of this sort of um, standard library way, ways of doing things. The, the APIs resemble standard library APIs in a lot of ways. So the greenlit.join, uh, that dot join method, you know, is just like the uh, threading library. And that will allow that greenlit to actually run and finish running. And you can see here that it prints three. So it's adding one and two in this example. Um, gevent.sleep is the most basic uh, way of uh, suspending execution of a greenlet. And it works in pretty much the same way as time.sleep from the standard library, but it doesn't block your thread. It simply blocks the greenlet and tells gevent that it can run other greenlets. Uh, so in this example, I'm spawning two functions. One, uh, they both just print their names, but the first one sleeps for two seconds, so you can see, and the second one sleeps for only one second, and you can see that it prints function two first because of that. Uh, Gevent has a timeout. Uh, you can basically um, run any Gevent code uh, with this, and if it hits a spot where the, uh, where Gevent is cooperating, uh, where your code is actually cooperating uh, and the time limit has elapsed, it'll either throw, throw an exception uh, or uh, in this case, I, I'm telling it not to throw an exception, uh, in which case data just never gets set. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the timeout's only one second, but it tries to sleep for two and uh, obviously in this situation, the timeout elapses before it can actually set data. Uh, G-Event comes with a number of synchronization primitives. Uh, event and what the th next thing I'm going to talk about, async result, are both useful for uh, building uh, libraries that use Greenlit uh, or that use G-Event. Um, so these, these are a little lower level. Basically, event is a way of uh, creating an object that uh, when you set it, it will wake up a number of greenlets that are waiting for it. Uh, so it sets once, wakes up multiple. Uh, async result is similar, but it sets a value. Uh, it's good for, if you have a greenlet that's going to set the value on an async result object after some amount of time, other, an other greenlet can actually run dot get on that async result and it will block until the other thing sets the value. Uh, so in essence, just like event, uh, you can have multiple greenlets waiting for the result and as soon as one finishes, the other ones will be woken up in order and one thing I use often in Greenlit or in Gevent is the queue object. And this also resembles the queue object that you're probably used to from the standard library. Uh, there's you know, one in threading, there's one in multiprocessing. Uh, and so it works in the same way. You can, uh, you know, this is a first in, first out queue. Um, you can, uh, add items into the queue, and you can have any number of greenlets consuming items from the queue. Um, and the dot get method on the queue will block the current greenlet, but continue resuming execution of anything else that it can. Uh, there's a pool object. Uh, this is a way of limiting concurrency. So obviously, if you want to make 100,000 API requests, you don't want to do them all at once. Uh, that would kill your system. It would probably kill your API agreement with whoever you're dealing with. So a pool is a way of just saying, I want to fire up a number of greenlets, but just limit that to a number. Uh, a pool is initialized with a size variable. And in this example, uh, 
I'm telling it to spawn three different greenlets in a pool the size of two. And the first two uh, successfully spawn the greenlets, but it's not running them yet. It's not until we try to add a third greenlet to the pool that uh, it says, hold on, I have to finish at least one of these two greenlets that are sitting here before you can add a third. And so it executes the one that prints the number two and then immediately adds the third greenlet to the pool. And then pool.join uh, finishes execution of uh, the greenlet pool. One thing I'm really excited about uh, is the thread pool object. This is actually not in the current stable version of gevent, uh, but if anybody's just getting started, I'd recommend using gevent 1.0 beta. It introduces the thread pool. Um, and the thread pool is really fun to work with because it kind of takes some of the headaches out of dealing with uh, threading when you have a lot of a collection of objects that you need to uh, have it work on. You essentially create a pool, it, it fires up four threads, and then you apply data to it. You can, you can run pool.map, there's uh, a pool.apply. You can run various types of functions that'll block the current greenlet and execute things on, on uh, multiple threads. This is useful for if your library uh, doesn't support gevent and it makes uh, operations which block the current thread. Uh, and it can actually result in speed ups if uh, you're dealing with a library which actually releases the gill. Uh, one example is LXML. Um, I've been able to use Threadpool to get multi-core performance boosts out of um, parsing a, a collection, a, a large collection of uh, LXML documents, and they'll each run in a separate thread uh, in it, with a pretty simple API you ask me. Um, GEvent's mostly used as a networking library, so obviously it has some basic uh, server and socket primitives. Uh, this is the simplest way to create a TCP server in GEvent. Uh, there's also a datagram server or UDP server available. Um, this is just something that echoes back your IP address when you talk to it. Um, and it's pretty basic. You could, you could actually expand on this to make a simple telnet-based chat client uh, with probably no more than uh, 10 more lines of code. And it's high performance, it's non-blocking. If I were to run socket.receive here, it would wait forever for data uh, while still accepting other connections in the same thread. Geovent.socket is actually the object that you get when you are using the stream server that I described in the last slide. And Geovent.socket is exactly API compatible with the socket module from the standard library. But when you do blocking operations on gevent.socket, it will cooperate with your other greenlets. It will allow them to run. Uh, when you're, this actually opens up the door for using a ton of third-party libraries. Um, here's an example of just a few that I could think of. But when you're using monkey patching, you're replacing uh, the socket module in the standard library with the one from gevent. And since it's API compatible, typically things will just work. Monkey patching obviously is kind of taboo, but I think that it's worth it when you're dealing with gevent because in my experience, if I dealt with gevent without having the ability to do monkey patching, it would just limit severely the number of third-party libraries I could use or at least it would require me to fork those libraries and really do nothing more than replace import socket with from gevent import socket. Um, so, G, so monkey patching, I think, is an acceptable use case uh, when dealing with gevent. So, in addition to socket, um, 
There's a few other libraries that are in the standard library that are affected. Um, this is the list of them. Uh, for example, time has the sleep function. It'll replace with gevent.sleep if you run patch all from gevent.monkey. Um, and you know there are more more libraries affected. Uh, for example, you know URL lib to if you perform HTTP requests, it is using the socket object from the standard library, so it also will become cooperative when you use gevent.monkey. So how does this all affect Django? Well, we know that Django is full of blocking APIs, and I think a lot of us, myself included, for a long time didn't really think it was realistic to, to have concurrent Django processes within the same thread, you know. Um, but it, it does become possible when you're dealing with monkey patching and using green libraries to add uh, G event support to Django. Um, and it actually becomes a perfect fit because Django is just full of, you know, you run a function call and you expect data to be returned. That doesn't really work if you're using a callback a based approach. You could run Django under Twisted, but you're not gonna gain the benefits of an asynchronous framework. Um, so really, coroutines and specifically, you know, gevent and eventlet are pretty much your only options for getting good um, uh, concurrent single-threaded uh, application performance out of Django. So how do you add gevent to your Django project? Basically, if you're using gunicorn, it's very simple. Uh, if you have a gunicorn.conf file, you just say worker class equals gevent, and uh, gunicorn has that built in. Uh, it will fire up gevent workers in each of the gunicorn processes, and that's, uh, that's about it. It also, gunicorn will automatically run the monkey patching for you if you use this worker class. So it's pretty easy to use. There are some caveats you have to think about. Um, you need to be using a green database library if you're planning on using the ORM. For Postgres, um, Psycho PG2 has coroutine support, uh, and this package called Psycho Green uh, basically makes it work with Gevent. Uh, when you run make Psycho PG Green, it it applies the right callbacks and makes. Uh, Psycho PG2 basically just work. Uh, if you're using MySQL, um, there's a library called PyMySQL, which is actually a pure Python MySQL library. Uh, you actually need to be using a pure Python library if you want to make use of the patched socket module, uh, because normally the MySQL DB package that most people are using, it's a uh, C extension product module and its socket calls are in pure C. Those can't be patched. So you need to be using PyMySQL or something similar. Um, and it, it will just work. Since it uses the socket module and GUnicorn automatically patches that, uh, it should just work. The, the only thing you, you do need to do is um, ha run install as MySQL DB so that when Django goes to import MySQL DB, it will get PyMySQL instead. And just to note, these are both post fork uh, hooks, which if you put those in your gunicorn.conf file, uh, gunicorn will, um, will run these functions as soon as it forks off the new processes for the workers. So um, if you're using Celery, uh, Celery actually in newer versions contains uh, a gevent worker class. Um, this is pretty useful, especially if you're doing a lot of API calls in your Celery tasks. You can actually get really good performance. So that's just built in. Now if you're using WebSockets, or if you're wanting to use WebSockets, uh, that's definitely one of GEVENT's amazing use cases. Um, doing Comet is possible in Django. 
Um, G event WebSocket is just for, you know, if you, for some reason, it, it, most people are gonna use G event socket IO, which provides more than WebSockets. It can do long polling and some of the other things that, that uh, some browsers don't support, because WebSockets obviously are a, a very small subset of browsers. Um, but G event socket IO gives you that. Um, and so these, uh, these worker class uh, statements, these would be put into your gunicorn.conf uh, in place of, you know, just the base G event one. And then um, if you need to scale, um, obviously you need to scale the front and the back. Um, so for messaging, I really like to use 0MQ. I uh, use it in a lot of places. Uh, ZeroMQ is a C, C extension library, so uh, the ZMQ, PyZMQ has actually G event support in the dot green submodule, and that works great. It was actually written by a good friend of mine, and um, that's a good way of messaging between servers if you have multiple worker servers there are multiple web servers that need to have some sort of communication. One of the things that people uh, do when they're starting out building applications using uh, WebSockets or Socket.io, we'll use the, I can't remember the API exactly, but Socket.io can allow you to broadcast. You'd say, you know, socket.broadcast a message, so it'd send it to all the clients. But that doesn't really work if you're using more than one server. So um, definitely 0MQ, and uh, Redis also has, they both have good pub sub support. And this is a good way of kind of scaling out and, and sending messages to all the servers and having those trickle down to all the clients. Uh, if you're load balancing using, uh, if you have multiple servers and you need to load balance them and, they, and they're running uh, WebSockets, uh, you're gonna quickly find out that a lot of web servers don't really support WebSockets because WebSockets aren't real like normal HTTP. So, but um, HA Proxy and Varnish both have WebSocket support. Um, I'm sure there's, there's more, but I really like Varnish. I'd recommend checking it out first. Um, and that's actually gonna be it. I'm done a little bit early. Thank you. Hi, Cody. So you mentioned um, numerous examples of uh, networking I.O. being blocked and how G event works around that. Can you talk a little bit about how it interacts or G inter sorry, G event interacts with things like files on the file system, like if you had, say, a file field in your models or an image field? Sure. And what um, is your there? So right now, there's actually not any really good um, file support for G event. Uh, basically, that, that gets a little complicated. I know a friend of mine was working on a lib AIO binding for G event. Lib AIO lets you uh, in a cross-platform generic manner, uh, interact with files in the file system in a non-blocking manner. Um, right now, I guess, if you're uploading files, you know, one option, if you're using like a Bodo backend to upload files to S3, then those should actually be non-blocking. But yeah, file system stuff is definitely kind of a, a little bit of a blocker right now. You could use thread pools. You might be able to write, you know, a custom file backend for Django that would uh, that would give you that. But I think that's about your only options right now. Um, uh, most of this was over my head. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm just wondering when you would use the event. How do you know if you need it if you've never? done this kind of stuff before? Mainly, it's gonna be in situations where you can tell that your system is um, 
heavily I/O bound. So, especially when you have uh, when you're using like, when you're doing Comet or WebSockets, when you have a lot of connections, um, those are going to be the situations. Uh, sometimes just adding G event to any random Django project can increase performance, but you got to be careful because you do have to watch out for avoiding blocking calls uh, that that aren't cooperative. Um, but generally, I'd recommend basically just add the G event worker class to UG Unicorn and run some siege benchmarks and see what it does for you. Uh, so. Do you have any recommendations for debugging applications that are using GUnicorn? Specifically, if you have uh, you know, Celery workers that are running potentially 20 different greenlets, um, how can you get some sort of introspection on that and figure out what's going on? Uh, I use PDB a lot. And actually, PDB works really well with GEvent uh, as compared to using to threading, because I don't know if you've try to use PDB with threading stuff, but sometimes your input gets lost, I don't know. But when you actually, when you hit PDB, a PDB breakpoint uh, in a GEvent application, everything stops. Uh, and so you can, uh, and I actually meant to talk a little bit about using um, the GEvent backdoor. Uh, if you want to look that up, GEvent.backdoor has uh, a way of basically getting a Python shell uh, into your live system using Telnet. Uh, and so you can watch things kind of in real time that way. Uh, the last time I tried to use GEvent with, with Django, I found that it was really good for holding open lots of connections to the, to the end user. But one of the problems that I found was that I, could, I couldn't basically limit the amount of connections that my application was making to my database. Um, have you found any good solutions for sort of limiting that number of connections? Is there a connection pool or, or any tips you've found for that? Um, now that's a really good point. Um, I guess uh, I don't really have an answer for that right now, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> I appreciate the question, though. That's, that's good. I was just wondering if that uh, that code block you put in the gevent.com to enable the Postgres support is that is that a requirement for using Postgres in gevent or can you leave that out and just w it wouldn't take advantage of the gevent capabilities? You're going to have a lot of really long running requests if you do that because uh, what happens is that gevent will accept a bunch of requests and start doing database. Uh, I/O, um, but since it has to wait for all of these database operations to finish before it even serves the first request, because they're all blocking, uh, you actually end up with pretty high latency, uh, and it's inefficient. It, it really kind of ruins the point, you know. If you if you don't have a database com or a GEvent compatible database dr database driver, uh, you're probably better off not using it. <laughs> but Thanks. Yep. In one of the slides at the beginning, you mentioned gevent.timeout. So is it possible to use it with Django in a way that you put a timeout so that if a request takes, say, more than 60 seconds, it just kills it? And the reason I'm asking that is um, on HA proxy, for example, you can put a timeout that if the web server doesn't respond, the user gets a 504, right? But in the terms of Django, the request keeps going, and if it's hammering the database, the thing is going to keep going, and your user might click refresh and do that over and over again. Sure. Um, I think it would be trivial to write a decorator, a view decorator, that would apply uh, G-Event timeout features um, and then issue, uh, I'm not sure what the status code would be, but issue a timeout at that level. Uh, in addition, like I have, uh, I kind of do that at the Nginx level myself. Uh, I use, I think the default's a 30 second timeout, but that ought to be probably smaller. <laughs> um, but yeah, certainly you can do that. Hi. Hi. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, 
separating out the real time, like when you're doing something like WebSockets that's holding long running open connections, um, just splitting that out completely from your Django stack and having that piece, um, you know, it, it seems like there's two very different paradigms. You know, one wants to spit requests, you know, request response very quickly, and the other one wants to hold these long running open connections. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that philosophy versus kind of cramming it all into Django? Um, I think it would probably be smart if you're going to scale uh, very large to keep your uh, your WebSocket servers separated from your main web servers. Um, just for, I don't know, for my own sanity, I think that I'd want them separate just, just so I, uh, you know, just for debugging and monitoring. Uh, if, if one of these subsystems fails, then I guess that they'd both fail if they're all on the same servers. And all the stuff that I've done, which, you know, granted, I'll admit that I haven't had to scale these systems very far. Um, a single server setup has worked fine for me, but I think that that separation could be useful. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.